Well, again, welcome to you if you are just joining us. It's so good to see so many faces, so many faces that maybe are returning from out of town uh, to be with us this week. If you are joining us this morning, you have joined us on Christ the King Sunday. This is a point in the liturgical calendar, actually the end of the Christian liturgical calendar, where we get to celebrate Jesus as King, uh, enthroned with God the Father. And so with that in mind, we're going to sing this morning what is known in the industry as a mashup. This is a mashup of two songs. And the reason we're singing these words this morning is because what we want to recognize as we come together is what happens in our hearts as a result of crowning Jesus as king. And so we're going to sing about how he is the king of our hearts and how that works out in our lives. So let's, let me invite you to join in singing with, with us together. the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the answer for my life only oh, is my song cause you are good you're good There is new wine, cause where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom, the kingdom is here, I lay down my offering to carry your new fire today, 
where there's new wine. Cause where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. The kingdom is here. I lay down my so much for singing with us. You can take a seat. And kids, this morning we have a special time for you. So if you would like, you're welcome to join us down here in the front with Rupali. We have a special time for our young disciples. So we invite you to make your way forward. Don't want to be alone up here. So you need to come up. Sit with me. So glad to see all of you. Wow. Yes, come on down. So I wanted to share with you something that's written in the Bible that's kind of really cool. You want to hear about it? So Jesus was hanging out with all his buddies, his disciples, and you know what they said to him? They said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you can imagine them kind of like saying, I know he's going to pick me. I know it's going to be my name. And they're all probably thinking, oh my gosh, everyone's going to be so disappointed when he calls my name because I'm going to be the greatest. And you know what Jesus does? He kind of does this a lot. He turns things upside down. And this is what he said. He called a little child to him. And he said, unless you adults change and become like little children, like you guys, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that crazy? Because look, look around, look at all these adults here. Look at me, look at all, all of them have to become like you in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why do you think Jesus says that? Why does he say become like a child? What do you think? Yeah. Children are mostly innocent, yes, and we need to become innocent. That's beautiful. And you know what? I'm thinking of two other reasons. One is you guys know how to live in the moment, right? Because adults, they kind of worry about the future, and they miss out on the moment. And you know the other reason why Jesus had become like a child? Because you guys know how to trust and we adults really struggle with trusting. So I kind of wanted to end with a little story. This is me when I was a child. I was five years old. And that's me and my dad. Are you five? You are? You're five too? OK, so that's me. I'm five right there. And that's me and my dad. And every, we lived in London. Does everyone know where London is? And every weekend, we'd go on these outings, right? on a bus, on a double-decker bus. And this Saturday, there was a football game, so it was really crowded. Actually, soccer game, they call it football. It was really, really crowded. So there were three buses, and it was my mom and my dad and me and my two sisters. And my dad said, get on the first bus. And he said to me, if you get lost, don't worry. I will find you. Guess what I did? I got on the wrong bus. I got on the first bus that was closest to me, but he meant the first one on the, in, the, in the front. So I got on the wrong bus, and there were all these people, and I'm thinking, I remember Dad saying, 
if you get lost, I'm going to find you. So I went to the top of the double-decker bus, and I sat there, and I thought, okay, I'm going to look out the window. And I saw Piccadilly Circus, and I saw the, the River Thames, and I, was, and I kept thinking, Dad's going to find me. I don't need to worry. So the bus stopped on the last stop. And I got, I walked down the double-decker bus, and who do you think I saw? Dad. Exactly, my dad. And you know what? He hugged me, and he said, let's go get an ice cream cone. And I remember thinking, Dad said, don't worry. And that's what you guys can teach us. You don't worry like we adults do, right? You live in the moment. And you also know how to trust the Father's voice, God's voice. So thank you all for being this role model for us adults, right? We need it, right? We need you guys because we need to look at you and say Jesus calls us to become like you, each one of you. You don't have to become like us. We have to become like you, okay? So let's pray, and then we're going to go back to your seats. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for these children. Thank you that you've given them to us so that we can look at them and remember what you want us to be like. Help us to become like these children, to become more trusting, and to become a people who live in the present and not to worry and be anxious. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Thank you, guys. Thank you. How do you follow that? <laughs> Thanks for Polly. If you are just now joining us, uh, a reiteration today is Christ the King Sunday. It's the last day of the church year. And so today is kind of like December 31st. And on December 31st, typically we look back at the year we've just gone through and we reflect on it. We look ahead to the year that is before us and we uh, make resolutions. But I think on Christ the King Sunday, what we're really challenged to do is wonder about the source of authority in our lives. Who gets the power to guide our lives? Who plays king or queen in our lives? And this is a great opportunity for us to reflect on that. We're going to be reading from the Revised Common Lectionary. That's a cycle of readings throughout the church year. The uh, lectionary has readings of Old and New Testament. We're looking at the gospel passage for this particular day. And it's probably familiar to you if you uh, have been in the church any length of time. Jesus is in the last night of his life. He has celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and he has uh, gone to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. He's been betrayed by Judas, abandoned by his disciples. He's been arrested by the religious authorities. He's been taken to Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, for a mock trial. And now he's in front of Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect, the eyes of Caesar, the emperor, on the Judean population. And now we read this, John 18, beginning at verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Let's pray together. 
Uh, Lord, we bow before you, our Lord and King, and ask that you and your spirit would now lead us, teach us, and transform us for your sake. Amen. I think it's fair to say that we Americans have a very ambivalent relationship with kings and kingdoms. Don't you agree? You think about how we were born as a country. We were born in revolution, rebelling against this king, King George III of England. And we have sought to develop a democracy, a republic, and we don't want kings. We don't want our presidents to be kings. And that's why we have checks and balances of a legislative body and the uh, the Supreme Court as well. We have an ambivalent relationship with kings, and yet we love power. We do love power as Americans, and we put our power not in kings, but in other people. Rock stars, rap stars, pop figures, CEOs, and others. These are the kings that govern and guide us in America. We are enthralled and enamored with power. And Christ the King Sunday challenges us. The people in the first century were also enamored with power, but they wanted a particular type of king. They wanted a Messiah, an anointed one, a Jewish king who would deliver them from Roman oppression. They'd been an occupied country for so long. They wanted different types of uh, Jewish king. The Pharisees, the religious Uh, leaders of the day, they wanted someone who would lead them in Torah, observance, righteousness. They wanted a religious leader. The Sadducees, the ruling elite in Jerusalem, they wanted someone to preserve their power over the temple. The Essenes down in the Dead Sea, the monastic community, they wanted an apocalyptic king who would come and bring in the end times and deliver them supernaturally. And then the Zealots, the Zealots, the freedom fighters, Uh, The revolutionaries, they wanted a guerrilla king who would deliver them with military might. And all these expectations are swirling around and come into this conversation Jesus has with Pontius Pilate. As he represents Caesar, Pilate wants to know if Jesus is a king. Jesus makes clear that his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is from another place. His kingdom is not about military might not about political power. His kingdom is a means to testify to truth, to God's truth. And in his kingship, Jesus gets a mock coronation. Not veneration, but flogging. Not a crown of gold, but a crown of thorns. A purple robe to ridicule him. Soldiers jeers and spittle anoints him. But Jesus makes clear that it is heaven and not Pilate who holds power. And the pious people around them, they cynically confess, we have no king but Caesar. Jesus' kingship turns upside down the kingships and powers of our world. And I want to reflect with you on Christ's kingship and how it's characterized by four main things. Number one, Christ's kingship is characterized by obscurity, not fame obscurity. We go into the Christmas season and all the traditions and all the decorations are so familiar to us and we miss the power, the power of Jesus born in a feeding trough, born in a cave, attended to by the lowest classes of Judea, the shepherds, smelly shepherds. Jesus is born in obscurity, not with fame. Secondly, Jesus is born and his kingship evidence poverty, not fortune. Luke, the gospel writer, tells an interesting story in chapter two of his gospel. He has the holy family, after Jesus was born, come to the temple to present their offering for purification. When a woman in Israel gave birth, she was considered ritually impure for 30 days, And then she and her family need to present an offering to become ritually uh, pure and sanctified. And so typically, Jewish women and their families presented a lamb. But the laws of Moses had a provision for poor people. They could present something less than a lamb if they didn't have the money. And so Jesus and his family come and Mary presents a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. It's a provision for the poor. Jesus was born in a poor family. 
Think about it for a minute. Jesus, the king of eternity. Jesus, who owned everything as the son of God. Jesus borrowed everything in this life. He borrowed his birthplace, a cave. He borrowed his cradle, a manger. He borrowed his home. We have no record of Jesus ever owning a home. He either slept in people's homes or he slept outside. Jesus borrowed a boat from which to teach his disciples. Jesus borrowed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. Jesus borrowed a room to have the Last Supper. And Jesus borrowed a tomb in which to be buried. Jesus was born in poverty, not with fortune. His kingship was characterized by a third thing. It was characterized by infirmity or weakness, not power. Infirmity. I shared with you two weeks ago about a uh, change in our family. My parents and and my my family of origin. My mother has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And um, thank you for your prayers and concern. A week and a half ago, I went and was in Riverside, California with my parents to to try to help out. And uh, I'm really glad I went, but it was really hard. And my mom uh, was not doing well at all. And my dad was exhausted. And it was evident to me, and it's become evident to our family, that my mom will not be a candidate for chemotherapy. And so she's just yesterday gone on to hospice. And with my time in Riverside, this text was particularly helpful to me. It reminded me that Jesus understands. This is an ancient text from Isaiah. We read it. Important text because this ancient text was quoted by New Testament writers more so than any Old Testament passage. Why? Because they saw Jesus in it. And this is the text that helped me. It says this, He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, weakness. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. This helps me. It helps me to know that my Lord, my Savior, my friend Jesus understands the infirmity and weakness that we're going through. That he understands that for you too. That when you are feeling weak and you are feeling out of control and you are suffering, you have a Savior who gets you and who's with you right now. How thankful we can be that our Savior, his kingship is marked by infirmity, not by power. John tells a story earlier in the gospel in chapter 6. He says that the people, the crowds, came to Jesus and they sought to make him king by force. But Jesus slipped away and escaped. Jesus doesn't want his kingship characterized by power. It's a kingship of weakness. It's from another world, challenging the kingships that we experience here. His kingship is characterized by obscurity, not fame. Poverty, not fortune. Infirmity, not power. And finally, humility, not pride. One of my favorite set of verses in the New Testament is from the end of Matthew's gospel, excuse me, chapter 11, where Jesus says to the people of that day and to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my Torah teaching on your shoulders and listen to me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. I am gentle and humble in heart This is Jesus. You know, it's so interesting. In the first century, humility was not considered a virtue until Jesus. The Greeks had a word for humility, and no one liked it because it meant low lying. But after Jesus, it became a virtue, a a Christian virtue. This is why Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey. Everybody expected the Messiah to come in on a white stallion a triumphant military leader. And what does Jesus choose? A donkey. This is his humility. Humility, not pride, characterizes Jesus Christ. When I was uh, shortly out of college, I spent a year in England where I studied and worked with a Christian institute called the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. It was run by John Stott, and he was pastor at All Souls Church, Langham Place. 
which is right next door to the BBC in, in West End of London. And I worshiped there. That was my home church for a, a year. I would go on Sunday morning and we'd also return, as is the custom, Sunday afternoon for two different worship services. And everybody who worshiped at All Souls, which is a, a, a really great church, we came in and this is what greeted us. Larger than life, this portrait of Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate. The title of this painting by Richard Westall was painted in the 1820s, given to that church by King Henry IV. And this is Jesus uh, before his persecutors. And this is what shapes that church in worship Sunday by Sunday. And it's been doing so since 1824. It's a reminder of who Jesus is and how his kingship challenges us and the kingdoms of this world. So how then does Christ's kingship challenge us today? How are we to be challenged and transformed by the kingship of Jesus? A couple reflections I have to share with you. The first is this, ambition. You know, in America, we seem to think that ambition is an unbridled good. Well, of course it's good to be ambitious. Why wouldn't we be? We want to succeed. We want to climb the ladder, et cetera, et cetera. But the year I lived in England, I got to know, among other people, Australians. And Australians have a very familiar saying. They say this, the tall poppies get lopped off. It's a call to humility uh, by Australian people. And I think the British are the same way. They don't, ambition is something they, did, they don't necessarily think is a good thing. The tall poppies get lopped off. Or as we've often said, the person who says this, I got to the top of the ladder only to realize it was leaning against the wrong wall. We need to check our ambition. It's not necessarily an unbridled good. It can actually drive us further from God rather than closer to God. So ambition is our challenge when we look at Christ and his kingship. The next thing we might think about is power. How do we view power? In America, we just seem to assume that more power is a good thing, less power is a bad thing. In the 1970s, this book was published for the first time called Servant Leadership, A Journey into the Nature of Legitimate Power and Greatness. It was a business leadership book published by this fellow, Robert Greenleaf. And his whole point was then and has been ever since, good leaders must first become good servants. Well, Greenleaf did not invent this idea, did he? We who know the Gospels and know Jesus, we know this idea came from him. Jesus who said that the Son of Man himself, he himself came not to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. Jesus who taught his disciples that if you would be great, you must be servant of all, just like Rupali shared in her message with the kids. This is why that this Christian nationalism and those tendencies in our country today are so so discouraging because there's a sense in which we are trying to use power to make the Christian faith prominent again in our culture. We're using secular power as a means to do this and that flies in the face of Jesus and how he viewed power. I, like many of you, follow Twitter and I found a tweet earlier this month from a fellow pastor and I wanted to share it with you. I'll just read it. Reverend Ben Kramer wrote this, such a good word. Dear Christians, our symbol is a cross, not a flag, not a gun, not a gavel, not bootstraps, not a legislator's pen. The cross is how Jesus exercised ultimate power in the world by laying down his life out of love for all. That is why our symbol is a cross. It's a good reminder, isn't it? We're challenged in terms of ambition and power. And the third thing, consumption. You know, we joke about that saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. But often that's how we live our lives. We're now entering a season of consumption, aren't we? Black Friday is November 26th. Cyber Monday is November 29th, and it's all about spend, 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 accumulate, consume. And it's a temptation that we face, and Jesus challenges us with our consuming habits. I love this title of a book by John Ortberg, formerly pastor at Menlo Park Church. 
The book title is this, When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. He's talking about life. When life is over, all that we've accumulated, all our stuff, it all goes back in the box, the box of the tomb, the grave, the coffin. The consumption that we do so unthinkingly and so naturally is something that needs to be checked. And Billy Graham, the late evangelist, said this. He said, we Americans, he's referring to, we American Christians, we are rich in the things that perish, but poor in the things of the Spirit. We are rich in gadgets, but poor in faith. We are rich in goods, but poor in grace. We are rich in know-how, but poor in character. We are rich in words, but poor in deeds. Wow. Jesus and his kingship challenge us in so many ways, in terms of ambition, in terms of power, in terms of consumption. And finally, a fourth thing, in terms of our reputation and role as a church. When I came here almost 20 years ago, we were twice our current size. We had 2,200 members. And we were the going church in Boulder County. If you wanted uh, prominence, you joined our church. We were sort of a country club church, many have told me. But we have halved our size. And this is, of course, a concern for us. However, I think there's a gift in it as well. We are a humbler church. We are a simpler church. I think we're a more approachable church. We have learned the hard lesson that when it comes to following Jesus, it's not about status, it's about service. And so our reputation and role have been challenged and reformed and redirected. And this is not necessarily bad. It can be a very good thing. The point is Jesus and his kingship is an upside down kingdom. And I love this quote, this quote by Donald Craybill from his book, The Upside Down Kingdom. He writes, kingdom values challenge the taken for granted social ruts and sometimes run against the dominant cultural grain. Jesus presents the kingdom as a new order breaking in upon and overturning old ways, old values, old assumptions. So true. This is the point of Christ's kingship. Think of Jesus as we conclude in his upside down kingdom. He was conceived in a scandal, cradled in a manger, warmed by smelly animals, welcomed by dirty shepherds, He fled with his family as a refugee to Egypt. He was apprenticed as a blue-collar worker in Galilee. He was baptized with sinners in the Jordan. He touched lepers, ate with outcasts, welcomed wayward women, befriended despised Samaritans, confronted the religious elite, spoke truth to power, hugged children, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He was betrayed by his friend, abandoned by his disciples, rejected by his people. He was scourged and spit upon, scorned and mocked, nailed naked to a cross where he suffocated and bled out in a scandalous, shameful death reserved for criminals and revolutionaries. His crown was thorns, his throne a cross, his grave a borrowed tomb. As Pilate said to the Jews, and scripture tells us today, here is your king. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, your example challenges us. It humbles us. It confronts us. We pray for your grace, the grace of your Holy Spirit to hear your word and to be transformed by it. Take us deeper into this journey, we pray. And may we follow you as our king. Amen.
take a seat, and we're going to spend some time in prayer this morning. Well, before we go to prayer, I thought Carl's words from Isaiah were a good reminder of who it is that our king is. And so let's read those just one more time. It says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot in like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And it's by his wounds that we are healed. So, Lord, we come before you this morning thankful that you are our king. We take a moment to just reflect upon what it is that is king in our life. And God, we ask for the things or the people or whatever it is that's not of you that we've placed in kingship over our life. We repent and we say we're sorry. We ask that we would be beckoned and called back to you. That we would remember what kind of king we come home to. We take a moment to sort of reflect upon those traits of you. We reflect on your obscurity, your humility, your humanity. And God, we would remember that you were human and that you became low and you let go of fame to be near us. And God, we reflect upon your poverty. That everything that you had, you borrowed that you were not so great that you couldn't ask for help. And God, we ask that we would be made into your image. People who are more obsessed with being impoverished than having abundance. And God, we reflect on your infirmity, your weakness. And Lord, we know that your scripture says that in our weakness, you are strong. And we pray that we would be a people who are not too proud to become weak. That we would reflect and look like you. And God, we reflect on you and your humility. We reflect on the fact that you became a baby and came into our world and grew up as a human and lived a life that looked like ours. That you walked alongside your friends and your disciples and lived life amongst your people. That you became Emmanuel, God with us. And that is not what kings and queens look like today, but that is our king. And God, we reflect on you as our king, the one true king, the one worth following, the one worth laying our life down because you laid your life down first. 
We pray that on this particular Sunday, we would remember and reflect on what kind of king we have, one that is humble but powerful, one that goes to the grave but overcomes it and is alive. One that comes in the form of a baby, but comes back in the form of a man and a powerful spirit that changes lives. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would transform us, that it would make us like you as our king. We surrender to you. We ask that we would be made to look like you. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Christ. Amen. We invite you to stand and we're going to sing one more song this morning.
Please be seated. Well, I have, we have some exciting news to share with you. That as you, if you've come to one of our response sessions, you've heard that the session has reaffirmed uh, a strategic plan with ministry and leadership priorities for the next one to four years. Uh, the, the, pri the number one ministry priority is to shift primary ministry focus to local and outward facing. And the number one leadership uh, priority is congregational care during the transition. We are excited, uh, and Carl's gonna explain what, why we're excited, uh, to invite Rich Bledsoe onto our staff uh, to help us with primarily congregational care and to free Carl and I up to help us move out, more, be more outward facing as a congregation. To, to live the gospel that we've just heard and sung. So Carl, go ahead and introduce. Well, I think as many of you know, we've lost a number of pastors and yet our needs for congregational care have only increased. And the cadence of deaths and of hospitalizations is really high and fast right now. And it's just not sustainable. So seeing this, our session and our leadership have uh, desired to take Rich Bledsoe and, and boost his hours to half time. Rich has been here on Fridays, uh, pinch hitting, kind of being pastor on call. Rich has been with our church for a long time, and uh, this is gonna give us a, a more ability to respond to needs, and, and it's gonna be a great thing. And as Randy said, it's gonna allow me uh, to, uh, to do some other things outreach-wise, particularly in a university setting. So, so more on that to come, but we want, Rich, you to tell us a little bit about yourself and about your sense of call and what lies ahead for you. Well, this church has been very foundational in my own development. It goes all the way back to my university days with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. When I first came here to do an evangelistic outreach, summer outreach in the summer of 1970, and some of you, I actually see some, there are some people who were here at that time. Um, since then, I, I was sent to seminary, uh, pastored another church for 20 years, and that church, uh, we closed its doors, we had church plants go out of us and so on, and we eventually found our way back here. I've done a lot of Bible teaching in this church, and a lot of your faces are, I know you, you've been in my classes for a lot of years. I've also been a hospital and a hospice chaplain for many years. So I, I, have, I have some uh, experience in doing <laughs> care for the sick, uh, hosp hospital care. Um, I've done a, my own share of funerals, and I know Carl has uh, needed some help, and the church has, has been understaffed for a good period of time, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, now come on board and participate in a, in a, at a greater level and be able to uh, uh, offer this ministry to the church, and I'm very grateful to be here. May God bless all of you. Mm -hmm. Well, before, before Carl gives the benediction, let's just pray together. God, we thank you so much for Pastor Rich, for his love for you, his love for people, his deep and long experience in care, uh, in hospice work, in chaplaincy work, in pastoral care. We pray that you would bless him in this new role, and that you would bless us by his ministry among us. Give him energy, intelligence, imagination, and love as he comes into our midst. Lord, we're just grateful that you are at work in the healing uh, of our congregation. And as we begin to look outward again, would you fill each one of us and equip us to be your witnesses to give a reason for the hope that is within us. So we thank you for Rich, and we thank you for one another, and we thank you most of all for your provision. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you both very much. Um, well, we're really glad that you were worshiping with us today, uh, whether online or here in the sanctuary. And if you've brought a particular need here in the sanctuary and would like some prayer, We've got a bunch of prayer ministers over here ready to pray with you and for you. 
If you brought an offering and would like to give that to back to God as, as part of your worship, there are offering boxes in the back, and you can also give online. Um, what a challenging example Jesus has set for us, and we go forth needing his blessing. So now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, 